I'm Juan Gonzalez. Renowned African-American historian Manning Marable passed away on Friday at the age of 60, only days before the publication of his monumental biography of Malcolm X. Marable suffered for 24 years from an inflammatory lung disease and had a double lung transplant in July. He died of complications from pneumonia. Marable devoted his life to writing the definitive biography of the civil rights icon, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, is published today by Viking. Two decades in the making, the nearly 600-page biography is described as a reevaluation of Malcolm X's life, providing new insights into the circumstances of his assassination, as well as raising questions about Malcolm X's autobiography. Uh, Marable was professor of public affairs, history, and African-American studies at Columbia University. He founded and directed the Institute for Research in African-American Studies. He authored several texts and was active in progressive political causes. Marable appeared on Democracy Now! in 2005 and again in 2007 to discuss his life's work and the biography of Malcolm X. We're going to turn to excerpts from those two appearances. Marable talks about the missing chapters from Malcolm X's autobiography and the groups implicated in his assassination. I think that Malcolm X was the most remarkable historical figure produced by black America in the 20th century. That's a, a heavy statement, but I think that uh, in his 39 short years of life, Malcolm came to symbolize black urban America, its culture, its politics, its militancy, its outrage against structural racism. And at the end of his life, a broad internationalist vision of emancipatory power, uh, far better than any other single individual that he shared with Du Bois and Paul Robeson, a pan-Africanist internationalist perspective. He shared with Marcus Garvey a commitment to building strong black institutions. He shared with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr a commitment to peace and uh, the freedom of racialized minorities. He was the first prominent American to uh, attack and to criticize the U.S. role in Southeast Asia, and he came out four square against the Vietnam War in 1964, long before the vast majority of Americans did. So that Malcolm X represents a cut, the cutting edge of a kind of critique of globalization in the 21st century. And in fact, Malcolm, if anything, was far ahead of the curve in so many ways. Most people who read the autobiography perceive the, the narrative as a story that uh, now millions of people know. And it was, uh, it's a story of human transformation, uh, the powerful epiphany, Malcolm's journey to Mecca, his renunciation of the nation of Islam's racial separatism, his embrace of uh, universal um, humanity, of, of humanism uh, that was uh, articulated through Sunni Islam. Well, that's the story everybody knows, but there's a hidden history. You see, Malcolm and uh, Haley collaborated to produce a magnificent narrative about the life of Malcolm X, but the two men had very different motives in coming together. Uh, Malcolm did, what Malcolm did not know is that back in 1962, uh, a collaborator of uh, Alex Haley, a, fellow named Alfred, a journalist named Alfred Balk, had approached the FBI regarding an article that he and Haley were writing together for the Saturday Evening Post. And the FBI had an interest in um, castigating the uh, nation of Islam and uh, isolating it from the mainstream of Negro act, uh, civil rights activity. And, um, and so consequently, a deal was struck between Balk, Haley, and the FBI, that the FBI provided information to Balk and Haley in the construction of their article, and uh, Balk, was, Balk was really the interlocutor between the FBI and the two writers in putting a spin 
on the article. The FBI was very happy with the article they produced, which was entitled The Black Merchants of Hate, came out in early 63. What's significant about that piece is that that became the template for what evolved into the basic narrative structure of the autobiography of Malcolm X. One of the striking things about doing research on Malcolm X, and I believe that most Malcolm X researchers could tell you their own stories, is that um, there's this paradox of the, la the absence of critical information. Malcolm X is a person who has uh, inspired, he's been the muse of several generations of black cultural workers, artists, poets, playwrights. There are literally a thousand works with the title Malcolm X in them. There are over 350 films and over 320 web-based educational resources with the title Malcolm X, yet the vast majority of them are based on secondary literatures, that is, not on primary source material. What is most interesting about the book is that, as I've read it over the years, it, something, was, something was odd to me. It's like, you know, Malcolm broke with the NOI in March 1964, and then in that last uh, 11 chaotic months, he spent most of the time outside of the United States. Nevertheless, he built two organizations in the spring of 1964. First, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, which was a religious organization that was largely based on members of the NOI who left with him. It was uh, spearheaded by James uh, 67X, or James Shabazz, who was his uh, chief of staff. And then secondly was the organization of Afro-American Unity. This was an organization that was a secular group. It largely consisted of people that we would later call, several years later, black power rights, black nationalists, progressives, coming out of the black freedom struggle, the Northern Students Movement, stu uh, people, students, young people, professionals, workers who were dedicated to black activism and militancy, but outside of the context of Islam. There were tensions between these two organizations. And Malcolm had to negotiate between them, and since he was out of the country a great deal of the time, it was rather difficult for him to do so. It seemed rather odd that there's only a fleeting reference to the OAAU inside of the book that's supposed to be his political testament. And I wondered about this, and it seemed like something was missing. Well, as a matter of fact, there, there is. Three chapters. And those three chapters really represent a kind of political testament that are outlined by Malcolm X. And to make a long story short, they're in a, a safe um, of a Detroit attorney uh, by the name of Greg Reed. He purchased these chapters in a sale of the Haley estate in late 1992 for the sum of $100,000. And since that time, no historian, or at least I suppose I'm the exception. Uh, very few people have actually had a chance to see the raw material that uh, was going to comprise these three chapters, the missing political testament that should have been in the autobiography, but is it? I could say that very few people have seen it. Um, Reed, after a series of conversations, Reed said he would allow me to see this. This was about mm, two years ago. I flew out to Detroit. Um, I asked when could I come over to the office, and he said, no, let's, let's meet at a restaurant, which struck me as rather odd. We met at a restaurant. He came with a briefcase, and he opened the briefcase, and he showed me um, the manuscripts, and he said, I'll let you take a look at this for about 15 minutes. Well, that wasn't very much time, and I was deeply disappointed. Nevertheless, in that 15-minute time, looking at the content, because I am so familiar with what Malcolm wrote at certain stages of his own life and development, it became very clear that there is a high probability he wrote this material between, sometime between August or September 63 to about January 64. 
Now, this is a critical moment in his development. In November 63, he gives his famous message to the grassroots address in Detroit, which really kind of marks off the real turning point in his own development. But I would argue that equally important is a brilliant address he gives in Harlem in mid-August of 1963, which actually is one of my favorite addresses by Malcolm, which um, actually is, is superior, in my judgment, to the um, message to the grassroots address, where he lays into a critique of what then is being mobilized uh, the March on Washington, D.C., the pinnacle of the civil rights movement. Malcolm envisions a broad-based, pluralistic, united front, uh, which is spearheaded by the Nation of Islam, but mobilizing integrationist organizations, non-political organizations, civic groups, all under the banner of building black empowerment, uh, human dignity, economic development, political mobilization. He's already envisioning the NOI playing a role uh, collaborat cooperatively with integrationist organizations. I believe that if we could see the chapters that are missing from the book, we would gain an understanding as to why perhaps, perhaps, the FBI, the CIA, the New York Police Department, and others in law enforcement greatly feared what Malcolm X was about because he was trying to build a broad, an unprecedented black coalition across the lines of black uh, nationalism and integration. And in a way, it presages 30 years ahead of time, the Million Man March.